So, Sigmund Freud, I feel as if somehow I should have you, instead of being in a classroom sitting in these uncomfortable squeaky seats, lying on a couch in a beautifully decorated office, where I can tell you, facing away from me, tell me about yourself, <laughs> tell me about your childhood, etc. Freud is famous for developing the techniques of psychoanalysis and being sort of the paradigm case of a psychoanalyst. We're going to look at three stages of his view, primarily really the first stage, but there are, I think, three stages of Freudian theory. The first stage is an early theory that he develops in his 1903 book, The Interpretation of Dreams. So we'll look at that first. Then he has a mature theory that's developed throughout a variety of works published during the teens and 20s especially. Um, it really is the development of psychoanalysis. That's the title of one of his books. There's also the new introductory lectures to psychoanalysis and a variety of others. That culminates with a book called the Beyond the Pleasure Principle, which changes the theory somewhat. And then finally, he has a series of works on cultural commentary, uh, civilization and its discontents, the future of an illusion. And so we're going to look at all of those, but primarily, actually, at the first theory. Um, the second is so well-known, I will describe it, but I think you will already largely know what it is. So let's start with the first stage, the interpretation of dreams. The book begins this way. He says, there is a psychological technique which makes it possible to interpret dreams. Okay? And if this procedure is employed, every dream reveals itself as a psychical structure which has a meaning and which can be inserted at an assignable point in the mental activities of waking life. Now, there are several very important claims he's making here, and I've tried to separate them out visually so that you can recognize them. One is, there is a psychological technique which makes it possible to interpret dreams. So there are several component ideas here. One is, dreams have a meaning. They have an interpretation. They can be interpreted. You might think dreams are just random psychological noise, for example, in which case they don't really have much of an interpretation. He's saying, no, dreams have a meaning. Moreover, there is a method for getting at that meaning. You might think, yeah, well, maybe they have a meaning, but there's no way to know consciously what it is. Well, no, he's saying there is a way, and he's going to give it to you. Moreover, he tells you that if you follow this, then two things will happen. First of all, you will be able to uncover that meaning, but then also you will see how the dream actually can be inserted in the contents of waking life. That is to say, our waking selves and our dreaming selves actually have this kind of intercorrelation. And that's an important point. I don't know if you've had this experience, but sometimes I've had a dream, actually with some frequency, where I'm in a place that doesn't look familiar to me at all, and if I wake up, I think, yeah, I don't recognize that place, I don't recognize anything about it, and yet in the dream, it's remarkably familiar. It's as if I've been in this place many times before. And yet, I wake up and think, where is that place? I, I don't know. And yet, within the dream, it all felt very familiar. So sometimes I've thought, what if we have two lives? We have our ordinary waking life, and then we have one or maybe more dream lives, right? Which are sort of continuous, kind of disconnected, but nevertheless, you visit these places in your dream life. And so maybe in your waking life, you're a 21st century college student. Maybe in your dream life, you're a 17th century nobleman. Or maybe you're a peasant woman around the fall of Rome. Or maybe, you know, I, anyway, I don't know. But what if, <laughs> what if there are just these separate discontinued existences? Well, Freud's saying, no, 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 that's absurd. The dreams have a meaning, and that meaning can be inserted in waking life. There's actually a kind of continuity between consciousness awake and then consciousness in dreams. Well, you can see here, Freud's theory made an immediate splash. This is the El Paso Herald. Um, in 1917, saying, why, scientists claim every dream has a meaning. Secret thoughts and longings you didn't know you had are revealed in dreams. <laughs> okay, so this became very quickly a kind of popular view, and Freudianism became something that was sort of recognized by almost everybody. Today, in psychology departments, Freud's theories aren't given much attention or respect, but they still have a lot of influence in popular culture and still a lot of influence in the arts and in various... <laughs> backward departments of universities, unlike mine. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, never mind. Um, I will further endeavor to elucidate the processes to which the strangeness and obscurity of dreams are due, and to deduce from the processes the nature of the psychical forces by whose concurrent or mutually opposing action dreams are generated. So we're going to look at the process by which dreams are generated. Where do they come from? And he's, his claim is, 
when we do that, we're going to understand, first of all, why dreams are strange in some ways. And secondly, we'll be able to understand what is actually producing them, what the sources of the dreams are. So we'll not only be able to assign some interpretation or meaning, we'll be able to see actually how the dream is generated, or so he claims. Well, let's take a look at how we might think about this. First, let's think about the strangeness of dreams. What are dreams really like? And in fact, you might ask, can we tell dreams from waking life? This is one of my favorite philosophical passages. It's from the ancient Chinese philosopher Zhuangzi, and it goes like this. Once upon a time I dreamt I was a butterfly, fluttering hither and thither, <laughs> to all intents and purposes a butterfly. You might remember the scene in The Simpsons where Apu has been staying up many, many hours. <laughs> he says, the quickie mart is open 24 hours, the place is great, demands on my time. And after a week of not sleeping, he thinks he's a butterfly. Well, anyway, <laughs> I was conscious only of my happiness as a butterfly, unaware that I was myself. Soon I awaked, and there I was, verily myself again. Now I do not know whether I was then a man dreaming I was a butterfly, or whether I am now a butterfly dreaming I am a man. So let's go back to this question. What are dreams like, and how are they different from waking experience? Can you tell, for example, right now that you're awake, if you are? <laughs> How are dreams different? What are dreams like? What makes them different from waking life? They don't have detail. Ah, okay, good. They don't seem to have quite the same level of detail, right? Conscious experience has a great deal of detail. Now, actually, we're aware of only a small part of that. Our focal range is actually pretty small, so all sorts of things can be going on out here that I'm not aware of. Nevertheless, I can turn around and focus on them. You know, reality is pretty spe specific, and I can examine things with great precision. That doesn't seem to be true in dreams, right? Dreams have a kind of vagueness, a kind of imprecision, a kind of, you know, partiality that makes them seem different from waking life. What are other aspects of dreams that you think make them seem different from waking life? Yeah? More things seem transitory when I mean that. I mean, uh, when you read something on the board in a dream and you look away and you read it again, it changes. Okay, good. Good. There's a kind of continuity and endurance to the objects of waking life. For example, I look at you all, and then I look away, and I look back, and you're still there. <laughs> okay? Often in dreams, that's not really true, right? I mean, I, this has been a long time, back when I was in college and forced to keep a dream journal when I was in a psychology course. But I remember one dream where I was, I was like riding in somebody's car in northern Pennsylvania, in the area near where my grandfather had a cabin when I was a child. And then, all of a sudden, I was on board a boat with Odysseus, and we were coming upon some island. It's a question of, are we home, right? Because <laughs> I was reading the Odyssey in class. And then there's some other darn thing, and it's just, you know, it's, not, it's like, okay, we're there in a car. If I'm really in a car in northern Pennsylvania, I turn around, I look back, and we're still in northern Pennsylvania. Okay, we're still in that car. But here, no, suddenly, this unnamed friend of mine, <laughs> I don't remember who it was, but all of a sudden, he's Odysseus, and we're on a boat instead, and we're like in the Aegean Sea instead of northern Pennsylvania. And what's the deal here anyway? <laughs> right? Waking life isn't like that. It's not like I have these episodes where I'm teaching a class, and all of a sudden, I turn to the whiteboard, and I tur turn around, and, and now I'm at the San Antonio Zoo, and you're a bunch of lions. <laughs> that doesn't happen in real life, but it does happen in dreams. Yeah? Time isn't a direct correlation. It's kind of random doesn't really make sense in the dream. Okay, good. Time doesn't seem to make sense, right? In waking life, it generally does make sense. More or less, you have some idea of how much time has gone by. And in fact, if anything disrupts that, it's very, very strange. I was in a car accident one time, and it really did mess with my perception of time. I kept telling everybody, despite the blood flowing everywhere, I'm fine, I feel okay, I, you know, I'm normal. Uh, and my way of saying that, of course, was to tell people, I have no cognitive impairments, blah, blah, blah. But in fact, you know, I, later I'm finally home, and I say, what time is it? And my daughter says, it's about 6.30. I think, that means the accident was like six hours ago? And I said, I thought it was like an hour. <laughs> and it really, I just remember very little of that intervening time. I remember somebody coming over to me and leading me to the side of the road. Somebody appeared at one point and bandaged my arm. Then the ambulance arrived. Then I was somehow home, floating in my swimming pool, looking around saying, what time is it? <laughs> and, 
And so, you know, when that happens in waking life, it's very disorienting and you think, what on earth is going on? But in a dream, that's kind of normal, right? It's as if things slow down, things speed up. You're there, somebody suddenly comes up and threatens you and you want to run away and you find you can't run, right? It's just time slows down incredibly. It's like, oh, I'm trying to run away. Oh, I can't do it, right? Whereas in real life, some monster comes in here as it might appear in a dream. I think I could run out the door. I mean, I don't think I'd sort of, oh. <laughs> That seems like a ridiculous movie thing, but that really does happen in dreams. What else? Yeah. In addition, it's like there's no space in between different points in time to where you can be at one point in time and then at a completely different side of the world. There's no, that in between is cut out, so that the two images are right next to each other. That good, right? There's this juxtaposition. Not only are things sort of not enduring, but there's this sort of sudden wait, this, then, then that. And normally, it would take a long time if it's possible at all to go from one to the other, but in dreams it can happen very quickly. And so there you are in your grandmother's house, and then you walk outside, and suddenly you're on campus. Well, ordinarily you might think, unless your grandmother lives on campus, <laughs> that takes some time, right? Uh, but in the dream, boom, there you are. And so there's something very weird about that. Yeah? You rely on feeling, like sometimes there's like, I know this place is my home even though I've never seen it before, or I know this person is my best friend even though it's like a made-up person, or it's like... Ah, good! All right, yeah, there's this, like, I've never seen this person before, but somehow I know this person is my best friend. <laughs> or, yes, this is very familiar, this is my house, even though it doesn't look anything like my actual house, right, or any other house I can remember, and so on. So there are these feelings of familiarity, unfamiliarity, these feelings of, for example, why did I know somehow in that dream that I was in northern Pennsylvania. There were trees. Well, there are trees over much of the earth, right? Why did I suddenly think I'm in northern Pennsylvania? I have no idea. It's not as if I saw anything distinctive. It's not as if there's much distinctive to see in northern Pennsylvania, actually. Um, I mean, it's beautiful, but it's just like lots of trees. Well, why was I there? I don't know. I just somehow knew that. And so, right, there are these sudden feelings you get, sudden things you just know in the dream, even though there's nothing going on in the dream that would let you know that. Anything else you can think of that makes dreams feel different? Yeah. Um, in dreams, it seems like there's a pervading logic, like everything has sort of a purpose, even though it's really bizarre. While in real life, things just kind of go, and you sort of more take it for what it is without really trying to make sense of it in like a story in a way. Oh, you know? all right. Yeah, good. Somehow, the dream, even if it, once you wake up, feels very disconnected. When it's going on, it feels very connected. It feels as if there's some kind of logical development going on. Whereas often in real life, it doesn't feel that way. You know, here um, you are in class, then you walk out in the hallway, you see somebody stumble and fall. Uh, it doesn't make much sense to say, what's the meaning of that? Right? I had this experience. I was in class, we were talking about Freud, then somebody fell down in the hallway. Whoa, what does it mean? <laughs> it's just kind of random, right? There's a lot of stuff going on in the real world. And it's not really as if it all fits one unified story that we can see at any rate. Maybe in God's mind, it's all like, ha ha, yeah. But, but for us, no, right? It seems as if there's just a lot of disconnected stuff happening. Whereas somehow in a dream, it doesn't feel like, oh yeah, and then some random things happen. It feels as if it's one continuous experience. Can you think of anything else in which the strangeness of dreams might consist? Yeah. What about ultra realistic to where you end up having a dream and then you realize that later on in your moment of like deja vu you actually realize that that was a dream a couple of days or a couple of weeks before ooh <laughs> that's well that's interesting actually yeah when we think about <laughs> that appropriate let up enough the machine fell asleep in his dream uh, oh crap wait a minute <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really easy to tell what my... Oh, well, now you can seal my iPad and know how to use it. Um, but yeah, it, there is this kind of connection, right? In dreams, things will be there that are elements of your waking life, appearing seemingly randomly in the dream. But conversely, sometimes you'll have a dream and then you'll wake up and you will either have something like that happen, say, as in a case of deja vu, or has this ever happened to you? Somebody you know well does something in the dream. And then it's like very hard to separate that out in real life. Maybe your friend does something terrible in the dream, right? Then you wake up and you're pissed off at your friend. <laughs> and it's like, but he didn't really do it. It was just in the dream, right? 
Um, I mean, years ago, I had a dream that my wife cheated on me. I opened up the door, and there she was, <laughs> in flagrante delicto, as it were. And it was like, you know, I knew that, look, it didn't really happen. This was a dream. But nevertheless, that was like weird. And so after that, it was kind of like, huh. <laughs> Why did I have that dream? And it, I mean, it, it's not like it lasted a long time, but for like a week, I was kind of like thinking, well, gee, should I be paying attention to, <laughs> you know, details of her behavior? Though? But look, it's just a dream. And so that kind of thing makes it sometimes hard to separate them out. Well, let's go back to this question. How can we tell dreams from waking life? Right now, probably you're convinced that you're awake. At one point, Descartes in the Meditations is writing about this, and he says, look, I'm convinced I'm awake. I think I'm sitting here in my robe writing by the fire. But then he says, well, <laughs> I've often dreamed that I was sitting here in my robe writing by the fire. And it felt real to me at the time. So how do I know right now that I am awake and sitting here writing instead of dreaming? He says, for all I know, I'm actually over there lying between the sheets having a dream. So how do you know right now you're really here in class and not just dreaming that you're in class? Maybe you fell asleep, right? So your mind is feeling guilty about it. And it's thinking, well, I'll make you dream that you're really there. Yeah? It's kind of going into lucid dreaming here. Uh, when you're aware that you're dreaming inside of a dream and that you can control it. Um, what, what I kind of do is that there, so I have this habit that I always do and check something that's, as in, for me, it's just the keys around my uh, neck. And then if there are two of them... But you just checked and they weren't there. Well... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I mean, like, inside a dream, if you check it multiple times, it, it, it feels like it constantly keeps changing. You can see it, feel that something's off. Ah, okay, right. Now, yeah, the classic thing in a cartoon is you pinch yourself, right? So, does that prove that I'm awake? You can turn on and off the lights. And in a dream, that won't change anything. Really? Well, what if you're dreaming, like... <laughs> <laughs> what if you're dreaming that you're in a class trying to prove that you're not dreaming? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, have you ever had dreams that you're dreaming and then you, like, wake up and then you realize you're still dreaming? It was like, I dreamt that I was dreaming and then woke up, but I'm still, it's all still within the dream. Um, anyway, yeah, it gets complicated. Here are some artistic visions of dreams. Here's Joseph's dream. Here is the night's dream. That's the dream of the Valley of Gardens. <laughs> That's Jacob's dream. That's an opium dream. <laughs> And that's Rousseau's dream. The tiger. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> I love the tigers. Right? This one looks, ah, oh, naked chick. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yes, here is Freud's theory of dreaming. Dreams are wish fulfillments. He says, when the work of interpretation has been completed, we perceive that a dream is the fulfillment of a wish. So, yeah, well, he has this ridiculous... What do geese dream of? Of maize. I guess geese eat maize, I don't know. Yes, so they are psychical phenomena of complete validity, fulfillments of wishes. So think of this as the Disney theory of dreaming. Okay? A dream is a wish. Your heart is. <laughs> okay, well, that's the basic idea. Okay, so now I went fast, so I'll go back to this. But yes, that's the idea. It's really a dream is a wish your heart makes. A dream is a wish fulfillment. So, you should be able to take any dream and analyze it and figure out what wish is being fulfilled. Now, sometimes it might be very easy. Maybe you fall asleep when you're hungry and you think, I'm, wow, you're there at the circus, let's say, and you're eating popcorn. You wake up and you think, yeah, I'm really hungry. Wow, I'd love some popcorn. <laughs> okay, so, well, big, complicated dream analysis, you want popcorn. Um, but in other cases, it might not be easy at all. Now, I want you to think about this theory for a moment. Dreams are the fulfillments of wishes. There's a really obvious objection to this theory. Nightmares? Nightmares, exactly. So you might think, wait a minute. All right, there are some pleasant dreams of maize and popcorn and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> But wait a minute, 
What about my dreams? <laughs> I'm in your nightmares, eating your souls. <laughs> okay. So, nightmares are the most obvious, right? I don't want to be chased down a dark hallway by some monster. I don't want peop people to leap out at me with knives and so forth. But there are also lots of dreams involving fear or anxiety that aren't exactly nightmares. Have you ever had the, ex the dream of, you know, you're there in your underwear, and you walk into class, and you realize, wait, I'm just in my underwear. And then I start passing these things around, and you realize, oh, no, there's an exam, and I haven't done anything to prepare. Um, or the professor's version of this dream is, it's November, and suddenly the chairman comes rushing up to me and said, says, you know, did you forget? You're supposed to be teaching blank, and then fill in the blank with something I know nothing about, right? You're, you're supposed to be teaching intermediate Chinese. It's like, what? <laughs> Damn, the students are there waiting for you. They've been waiting for you since August. <laughs> so I go running, running to the classroom, right? And I walk in, and there's a group of students who are sitting there really pissed off because they've been sitting there waiting for me for two months or more. <laughs> and so I walk in, and suddenly I realize, um, yeah, this is a class in intermediate Chinese. And so I write, you know, intermediate Chinese very slowly on the board. Thinking, yeah, I don't know Chinese, I'm a troll. Um, and anyway, that's the professor's version of that dream. I think. And it's not exactly a nightmare. It's not like, you know, I'm filled with fear and I wake up like I'm going to die. It's just there's a lot of fear and anxiety associated with it. Or, you know, sometimes they're just weird or unpleasant things or events. Lots of times dreams have this odd quality, or sometimes, right, it seems like it's just kind of a random replay of the day's events. And it doesn't seem like a wish being fulfilled, it doesn't seem like a fear or a nightmare, it just seems like random stuff. So in any case, all of those really would be objections to Freud's theory. So what do we do about nightmares? There was a German painter, Fusli, who painted a lot of nightmares, and here are some of his paintings. Very creepy. Yeah, that, that one's really disturbing, isn't it? That one, too. Is that the same dream? <laughs> no. It's like, well, maybe. I don't know. But <laughs> it's not the same page. Anyway, uh, yeah, here's Tom Paine's nightmare. OK. Well, Freud's response is this. We've got to distinguish the latent from the manifest content of dreams. Sometimes dreams you know, put the wish fulfillment right there in the manifest content. You look at what it's about, yeah, you're eating popcorn in the dream, you're thinking, oh, I'm so hungry, this tastes great. And so it's very easy to say it's a wish fulfillment right there on the surface. But that manifest content, in some cases, is quite distressing. Or it's just random or meaningless, seemingly. But there's a latent content, a hidden content, he says, that is the wish fulfillment. And so he draws a distinction very much like our two-level distinction between the manifest and scientific images. In this case, we've got this manifest conscious level of the dream, but then we've got the latent subconscious level behind the scenes, which is causing you to have that conscious experience within the dream, and which <coughs> explains the content of the dream, he thinks. So he says, in cases where the wish fulfillment is unrecognizable, where it's been disguised, there must have existed some inclination to put up a defense against the wish. And owing to this defense, the wish was unable to express itself except in a distorted shape. So the thought is, yes, sometimes you have a wish that the conscious mind can happily accept. You're hungry. You think, I would love popcorn. It... <coughs> <laughs> or perhaps you think, I wish someone would call me. I feel so lonely. <laughs> But, you know, that's something that, that, look, the conscious mind can accept. That's okay, right? But other times you have this wish that the conscious mind cannot admit, can't admit to other people, maybe can't admit to itself. And so the conscious mind sees this wish bubbling up from the subconscious and says, you want that? Oh, no. No, no. <laughs> uh, and presses it back down. Now, in waking life, that sensor, if you will, within the mind is very effective. It's like a bouncer at a nightclub, right? These undesirable types try to get into the conscious mind. These wishes come in and say, hey man, I want this. And the bouncer said, no way, dude, no way. Won't let him in. But what happens during sleep? The bouncer gets drowsy. The bouncer is there at the door guarding the nightclub. <laughs> and then kind of dozes off. Now he's still strong. He's standing in the doorway. So the dream can't get through in its ordinary state. 
The wish can't get through in its ordinary state. But it's distorted. It seeps through in a slightly altered form. And that's the theory of dreaming here. So there are psychic forces in the mind, one of which is constructing the wish. Okay, it's the subconscious part. It's constructing this wish somehow. And then there's another part that is the sensor, the bouncer, if you will. It forcibly brings about distortion in the expression of the wish, or it just suppresses it altogether during waking life. But when it's asleep, well, <laughs> yeah, the wish can get through, but in a distorted form. So it permits thoughts to enter consciousness, sometimes happily. Huh, you want popcorn? That's cool. What? You want to sleep with your mother? Oh. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> so these kinds of things are going on at that sort of sensor bouncer level. So the first agency, he says, is creative. Dreams express wishes on its part. The second agency is defensive. The wishes of the first might be approved, but they might also be suppressed. They might just be distorted. So here's the picture. Well, actually, this is a picture I found of what he has here. Notice here, unlike the more mature theory, there are only really officially these two parts. The id and the ego it's labeled here. The id, that source, that creative part, and the ego, the part that is the bouncer. Later that gets changed. But let's do it more neutrally. You might say, here's the creative agency down here. There's a sensor at the boundaries of consciousness. And there's consciousness. And the sensor is basically taking this wish and saying, well, all right, will I admit you into the conscious mind? Here's one possibility. No. <laughs> I will suppress you. I will repress you. It's called repression if all this happens completely unconsciously. It's called suppression if consciousness is aware in some way that there's some wish that gets squished out. Does consciousness help the sensor push it back or not? If not, it's repression. If yes, it's suppression. And the, well, there's the option of like the popcorn, just acceptance. Oh, you want the conscious mind? Sure. The sensor may allow the wish in. Or, there may be a process of distortion. The sensor permits it, but only in an alternative form. And so that is distortion or sublimation. Well, as I've mentioned, sleep lowers the resistance of the sensor. Basically, the bouncer gets drowsy and starts getting sloppy about what gets allowed into consciousness, hence dreaming. Okay? That tells us dreams are really important, actually. They're a window into that subconscious mind because wishes emerge in dreams that couldn't emerge in conscious waking life. So what do you really want? Not just popcorn or lunch or something, but no, what are your deepest, darkest, most hidden desires? Ooh, your conscious mind can't face that. But dreams are the ticket. Dreams tell you what they are. But not literally, of course, not just in terms of their manifest content. You have to interpret them and uncover the latent content of the dream. And that will give you a picture into your deepest, darkest, most hidden desires. So again, you can see these media reports. This from a San Francisco newspaper, Mystery of Dreams Revealed. <laughs> so it talks about Freudian theory and tells you how it works, roughly. It's actually not a bad report article. <laughs> it's just a little box with a larger article on the road to the burying ground. OK. okay. The essential nature of consciousness then, well, why does it tell us something about that? Admission to consciousness is a separate psychic act. Consciousness is basically, he says, a sense organ, perceiving data that originates elsewhere. Originates perhaps in the senses, if we're simply perceiving the world, but more broadly, originates in subconscious processes, the subconscious mind. Some of that itself can consist in, well, neural impulses and things like that, that are from the senses. Sometimes it consists of these wishes, these desires, that then get expressed unaltered or in distorted forms, or maybe get repressed. Well, you can probably already see here how this is leading to the mature theory. We've really got three components, not just two, although Freud talks in terms of two when he's writing about this in The Interpretation of Dreams. We've got the conscious mind, we've got the subconscious mind, the creative part that originates these wishes, and then we've got the sensor, right? We've got the bouncer at the doorway. Well, in the mature theory of psychoanalysis, that becomes a tripartite cell. There are three distinct parts. In the mature theory, the ego. That just is Latin for I. It is the self. It's the part that relates to the external world that decides and that acts. This is what you ordinarily think of as yourself. 
Who am I? You're thinking in terms of the ego. It's the part that is doing conscious decision making, that acts, that perceives the external world, that in general relates to the external world. And so to the extent that there is a you here, that isn't just a bunch of things, <laughs> it's that. And there's the middle age Freud, right around 1903 actually, when he was writing The Interpretation of Dreams. But then there is also the superego, above the eye. It observes the self and makes judgments. It's something like your conscience. And he says, it's really an internalization of parental authority via identification. You identify with your parents who are putting these external commandments on you, and you start imposing them on yourself. So the conscience, the superego, is like a little parrot sitting inside your mind saying, don't do that. That's bad. Cut it out. You should feel guilty. I mean, you might think, my parents weren't like that. Um, keep in mind, Freud is Jewish. <laughs> so it's like a Jewish mother. <laughs> in your brain, it's like, cut it out. No, why are you doing that? You should be doing this. So. Then there is the id. The it. And here's a young Freud. Unlike that superego, old crotchety Freud, here's the young vigorous Freud. <laughs> okay? The id, that's just Latin for it. It's alien to the ego. It's dark. It's inaccessible. There are instinctual needs and desires that originate here. Okay? It's also a source of energy, and it acts according to the pleasure principle. So the id is the source of desire. It's also basically the main engine, you might say, for the psyche. All the energy is really coming from the id. Then there's the superego that acts something like the sensor in the early theater. It's the part that is moral. It's saying, no, don't do that. You ought to be doing this instead. No, 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 not that, not that, not that. This, 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 and so on. And then there's the ego that actually has the task of acting in the world, trying to recognize reality, respond to the demands of the id, but also the demands of the superego. So here is a diagram of this with the German terms, S, which is German for it, then ich, which is German for I, and then the über ich, the superego. And here's another somewhat nicer version of that same basic thing. Okay, so the ich, the ego, that is control. It's interesting, by the way, that Freud uses the German terms, but in English it always gets translated into Latin. I think that's curious. But anyway, it is controlled by the reality principle, as we'll see. The id, yes, that is controlled by the pleasure principle. And then the superego is controlled by morality. It's the conscience part. So, here's another way of depicting it. <laughs> Superego, id, ego. Or another version. I want it now! I need to do a bit of planning to get it. You can't have it. It's not right! Okay, now. What are these principles that the parts of the self operate on? The pleasure principle just says seek pleasure. Go for what you want. The reality principle says adapt yourself to the external world. Meet its demands. And then the morality of the superhero just says, do what's right. So the reason life is hard, Freud says, <laughs> is that the ego has to respond to all three of those things. It has to meet the demands of the id. It has to meet the demands of the superego. And it has to meet the demands of the world. So it actually has to adapt itself to the world, given the desires of the id, but also given the moral constraints supplied by the superego. Well. All of this encounters a problem in Beyond the Pleasure Principle. And it's a problem generated by the First World War. A lot of people began going to doctors who were in the trenches and were diagnosed with something that was called at the time shell shock. Now, the symptoms of this were various. Sometimes people simply withdrew and did not speak, did not act, just sat and wouldn't do anything at all. Other times, people reported nightmares. They had recurring nightmares of terrible things that had happened on the front. At other times, people just had panic attacks. They just started screaming as if they were in the midst of battle and something terrible were happening. And so there were various complaints. All of these fell into the heading of what we would now call some form of post-traumatic stress disorder. And it was epidemic, really. The trenches were incredibly difficult places to be. They realized that, and they would cycle people through. So typically, you would only be in the frontline trench for a week. But the trenches were disgusting. Okay, There was constant shelling, not only by heavy artillery, 
but by mortars. Um, there was a lot of danger, even random danger, even if nothing much happened during your week. There was no attack, nothing significant. Still, mortar shells would occasionally land nearby. It was a very dangerous place to be. You would basically be working all night and then trying to sleep during the day, but it was very difficult to sleep. Um, you were constantly aware of the threat of death. The trenches in northern France were often flooded, which meant there was nowhere really to go to the bathroom. Dead bodies would just float around. Body parts would be lying around. It was a disgusting, horrible, traumatic place. And of course, people would periodically actually lose limbs themselves or be disfigured. Or they would see friends blown up. Or they would have to be there in the trench for most of the week next to the body of their best friend that was sitting there rotting beside their, their position and so on. And so people had various sources of serious trauma. They came in and began talking to doctors like Dr. Freud. Well, this was a difficult thing for him to explain, especially the nightmares associated with post-traumatic stress disorder. Somebody has recurring nightmares of being there on the front line and seeing his best friend blown up, for example. How do you account for that? It doesn't seem to be a wish fulfillment. He didn't want to see his best friend blown up. He certainly doesn't want to experience it again. He's coming to the doctor saying, stop me from having these nightmares. It's driving me nuts. But what's the latent explanation? Okay, on the surface, well, okay, you don't want to see your friend blown up. Um, what's the wish that's being fulfilled here? Freud couldn't find one. And so... It's especially, actually, let me just jump ahead. It's especially made difficult by this. The energy of the id, by this point in the theory, is sexual. Now, it's not really in the early, early version of the theory. There are just desires of all kinds that come from the id, this unconscious part. But later, it becomes specifically sexual. And that makes it especially hard. What sexual wish is being fulfilled by your friend getting his head blown up? I mean, that didn't make any sense. And so, really, there was nothing at all sexual about any of this, apparently. So he couldn't find anything at that level. Now, what are his options? Can you think of any way, given his view of dreams as wish fulfillments, that he can explain these post-traumatic stress nightmares? What could you do if you're Freud to account for this? Yeah? You wish that he could change the outcome? Ah, good. That seems to me very plausible. Your brain is trying to solve a problem. <laughs> Here's a situation, something terrible happened, your brain replays it looking for another outcome, right? Looking for a way to solve the problem. But it can't solve it. You're, after all, sitting there in the trench talking to your friend, and suddenly a, a random mortar shell blows him up. How do you, you, you know, if only I had, well, if only you had what, right? The brain's searching for that and can't find something. So one thing you could say is, it is a wish fulfillment. It's a wish that it turned out differently. The problem is the brain can't find the escape hatch. It can't find any way it could have turned out different. And so that would be one way. In fact, that seems to me a very plausible thing to say. It strikes me as odd that Freud never says it. Um, but what else could you say about this? You're always going to be scarred. Ah, good. You could say, look, something has happened here, right? After all, the person has been in some way damaged by the experience. So you could say dreams are normally wish fulfillments, but in this case, there is some interfering factor, right? Something has happened to the person that is either disrupting the normal function of dreaming so that it's now doing something else, or maybe you want to just say there's some completely different physical mechanism that is somehow overriding this. But in any case, you'd say, yeah, my theory is still basically right. Dreams are wish fulfillments ordinarily. But, hey, look, this is a case where something weird is happening. Ordinarily, if I take my keys and drop them, they fall. But if somebody's installed a big magnet in the ceiling and I drop them, maybe they zip up to the ceiling. And, well, it's because of this interfering factor, right, the magnet. So similarly here, you can say there's some interfering factor. Is there anything else you can think to say? Yeah. Um, kind of like playing off, like, the wish to change the outcome at home. It could also be like a wish to suppress it, but your brain can't find a way to suppress it. Ooh, okay, good. It might be that, yeah, um, there will be two ways of developing your thought. One is to say, yes, you have a wish that it turned out differently, and the brain would like to suppress that because it knows it can't solve the problem. But it just can't do it for some reason. The sensor has been stunned and has shell shock too. Okay, and so it keeps letting this stream come through when it really should be going like this. The other thought is to say, well, it's not just 
wishes, <laughs> right, that come bubbling up. It's all sorts of thoughts. And in this case, it's this recurrent thought of, it's a memory, basically. Remember, that happened. And the memory keeps pushing back. So then you'd have to say, well, but here's why he doesn't want to say it. Because then he would have to say, well, okay, dreams are fulfillments of wishes, or they are experiences of memories, or there could be other natures of those arrows pointing up, right, and trying into the conscious mind. He wants them all to be wishes. And so... He has to take the first version of your view and not the second, or else he'll falsify his theory. And of course, that's the other option. Just say, hey, maybe they're not always wishful moments. Yeah? Well, couldn't it be that the superhero is trying to, like, maybe he wants something, but the superhero feels guilty about it, so he's trying to suppress it? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
It's, you might say, this general desire to, or you could just say, no, the brain's just filing. I don't have a desire to look at these pieces of paper again. I'm just doing the filing. However, Freud goes further. He says, ah, oh, the desire to repeat our experiences is a desire to regain the past. It is a desire for the past. But then he says, and so far plausible enough, we'd all like to be younger. Okay, or at least past a certain age, you might not be. I would like to be younger. <laughs> However, he, then he comes up with this grand thing. Inorganic matter preceded organic matter. And that means all life would really like to go back to death. So he concludes with what he calls the death wish. The aim of all life is death. And he doesn't just mean it ends in death. He means it seeks death. It wants death. Remember I said a few days ago, so what is intrinsically good? What is desirable in and of itself? And somebody said, death. Well, Freud would say, aha, you were onto something very deep and profound, okay? You're right, Freud would say, exactly. Now, what kind of broad civilizational themes does he draw from this? Well, he sees society as facing the same conflict we face. We, the ego, faces this conflict between the desires of the id and the morality of the superego. But society does the same thing, okay? It's got to meet the constraints of the id. In other words, satisfy people's desires, but also maintain the rules of morality and meet the demands of the external world. And that's a hard thing for a society or a civilization to do. So, basically, his view is civilization largely consists of the structures of the superego at this social level. In other words, civilization is the thing that tells us not to do certain things. So he sees much of social life as a war between the desires of the individual kids and the superego of the entire society. Civilization. So civilization is basically at war with the id. Overall, happiness requires satisfying desires, but we've got to suppress or repress desires, and the difference is just whether it's conscious or unconscious that this happens. We've got to push those things back down, <laughs> consciously or unconsciously, and that has to happen at the whole social level. So civilization is a way of introducing mechanisms for doing that, controlling desires. And civilization, therefore, is at war with the end. Well, how does it do it? Primarily through guilt. <laughs> The superego has to convince the ego to restrain the id, and it uses the tool of guilt. That's how it does it. So civilization inevitably meet, makes us feel guilty. And really, in the end, he says, it makes us neurotic. It controls us by heightening our sense of guilt, which makes us neurotic. And so he has this sort of longing for being uncivilized. <laughs> he thinks that's inevitable in the human spirit. Well, I'll just... Actually, we have like one minute left, so I'll just say there are a number of criticisms. Um, he makes up the social science at this stage of his thought. He says, here's what religion is. There were sons. They found their father was dominating all the women, so they killed him. They feel guilty. That's why we pray to God the Father. <laughs> okay? He just makes this crap up. <laughs> um, there is a fire footnote. Page 37 of Civilization and its Discontents. I won't have, since we have one minute, I'm not going to waste it on this. But he basically tells you how male and female male sex rules got determined by people peeing on fire. <laughs> He's just making it up. Um, in terms of psychoanalysis itself, well, it doesn't do any better than if you're not treated at all. <laughs> I dreamt you were charging me too much. Ah, you're cured. <laughs> um, Karl Popper, Popper points out, really none of this is very scientific. Einstein made predictions that then could be confirmed or disconfirmed, but actually, Freud doesn't. All you ever do is ask, him, ask me about my feelings. And how does that make you feel? <laughs> <laughs>